Thank you for that very nice introduction. How's everybody doing this morning? Awesome. Well, you're mine for the next lovely 15 minutes, so let's enjoy it. Um, the images and stories I'm going to share with you have been taken on assignment with National Geographic for the past 20 years, and more recently with our nonprofit called Sea Legacy, which you've been hearing about. And thank you very much for your very generous contribution. I didn't know that was going to happen. We, we appreciate that. It keeps our, our team in the field. But, but really, my journey to become a photographer who specializes in, in the polar environments and some of the most extreme habitats on Earth, and to be a biologist and a photographer and a scientist and a conservation, that journey began when I was four years old. My family moved from Saskatchewan up to Baffin Island. And for those who don't know where they are, it's very nice to be speaking back in Canada. It's up by Greenland. And we, we lived in an Inuit community of 190 Inuit people. We were one of four non-Inuit families. At that time in the 70s, we never had a radio. We didn't have a television. We didn't even have a telephone. So what do you do as a kid when you live in one of these communities. That's why I get so excited when I see people like Chief Ian Campbell talk about connection to the land. And that's, for me as a kid, I would spend all my time with the elders out on the land, hunting and fishing and traveling, learning about the survival skills, but also at that same time, at that age, developing my right brain on storytelling and visual storytelling and oral history. And it just, at that age, I just deeply, deeply fell in love with the Arctic. And I knew I was gonna do something someday that had to do with, protect, with protecting it. The logical job at the time seemed to go off to university, get a job as a biologist, be out there, you know, we'd be out there on the sea ice for months at a time, tagging these bears. It's very stressful for these animals to be drugging them, putting collars on them, but I believed in the work, I believed in the science. We need to understand these polar bear populations, the effect of climate change, and meanwhile, over 500 bears are killed every year in Canada for sport and trophy hunting and for subsistence hunting. And through our science and our data collection, we figured out that too many females and young bears were being killed. When you kill a female, you're killing 30 bears. And so we made some recommendations. And rather than the quota going down, which it should have done, it actually went up to 700 bears a year being killed every year. And that's when I knew I needed to find a new path. And I thought, if I can just get a job with a little known magazine such as National Geographic, now I have the chance to reach people. And with each story we do, with National Geographic, we have the chance to reach up to 100 million people. But as you hear me tell the story of my evolution of a storyteller, it's not, it's not fast enough. A couple people have already come up to me telling me today about how they're a little cold, a little chilly outside. I care, I do, but I'm probably the wrong person for you to be <laughs> looking for sympathy. This is my office. This is where I get to go to work. But the urgency I feel is these are the places that nobody's going to get to experience. It's my job. Not everyone's going to get to experience the oceans or definitely beneath the ice. It's my job to bring that world to everybody else. And mostly what we do is put the faces and the names of the species that are being affected by climate change. When did scientists say that 30% of the polar bears on Earth are likely to disappear by the year 2050, what does that look like? What does that mean? For me, I want people to realize that ice is like the soil in a garden. Without ice, the Arctic will not survive. Without sea ice, Antarctica is not going to survive. That's how important it is. It's that cut and dry. And this is probably the most boring picture I'm going to show you today. But for me, it's one of the most important pictures I've ever made. To dive underneath that cold, windswept ice and to slip down below that ice. And then you're down there 10 feet below the ice. You're looking up. And the whole underside of the ice is moving. This is the production. This is the soil in the garden for these polar regions. In the spring, the sun returns to these habitats, pushes through the ice, phytoplankton starts to grow, and then you get the copepods and the amphipods that start to feed on that phytoplankton. And then from there, you get the polar cod that feed on this. You get the bowhead whales, the beluga whales, the narwhals, the bearded seals, the ring seals, the harp seals. All of this life depends on the production that comes from under this ice. So when scientists say to you, the Arctic is going to be completely void of ice in the next 20 to 30 years, I don't want them to be like, hey, we have a place for our ships to go now. Now we can just push through and save money and time and get through these areas. I want it to be a wake-up call for the world to say this habitat is changing faster, twice as fast as anywhere else on Earth. When you look at whales like this, the bowhead whale, the endangered bowhead in the Canadian Arctic, uh, just a few hundred of these guys left. There used to be 11,000. And just to think, they're also the oldest living mammal on Earth, the second largest whale in the world. And this whale right here could have been born near the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. It could have survived 150 years of whaling. And now its biggest threat 
is with the loss of ice, you get the loss of its food source, those copepods in that previous image. And this is how sensitive they are. When we talk about whales and migratory corridors and hearing about the Port Authority and what they're doing for whales really warms my heart. I was once in an area where we had a third of the population, 70 of these whales in one fjord, and somebody came racing into an area where we were working only with kayaks to film them, came in in a zodiac. It dispersed the entire population of whales for two weeks. They are that sensitive. When, so people start talking to me about seismic exploration, ship traffic, ore mining in the, in the Canadian Arctic. That stuff gets you extremely concerned. So we are up this year, there this year celebrating the Talarutiep Imanga Marine Protected Area in the Canadian Arctic. And you look at populations of these... Oh, let's see where we're going to go. That's all right, where we have these beluga whale populations. Again, you have thousands of beluga whales, up to 40,000, there we go. So these belugas that are in these very shallow estuary areas where they go in there to molt skin and they go there to raise, to raise their young. And it's incredibly sensitive, where you have 40,000 narwhals, tens of thousands of these, and now a growing population of bowhead whales. There's already so much pressure on these animals. You know, you have narwhals, you know, it's, it's just, they really are unicorns. It just doesn't happen to be a horse. It happens to be a 16-foot-long whale with a 10-foot ivory tusk. And scientists say that they're even more susceptible to a changing Arctic ecosystem than polar bears themselves. All the work that we do is the cross-section of art, science, and conservation. This is the work we do at Sea Legacy. It has to be beautiful. It has to lure you in. You know, our work's out there. I have a gallery in New York and where I want people to come in and connect with it. But we shoot these images so we can have a microphone, so we have a story to tell. We want to connect people to these ecosystems. It has to be based on science. It can't be just, you know, tie-dye hippie t-shirt and saying, hey, I love animals, you know, protect them. It's got to really be based on science. And then I want everyone to realize how connected we are to these ecosystems, that it's human-induced climate change, and this is what we have to address. You know, I'm also known for the crazy guy who loves to get in the water with 1,000-pound leopard seals, and, you know, and sadly, in 03, a scientist was killed by a leopard seal. The world said, this is dangerous, we can't do this. Uh, they were shutting down science projects, and so we said, let's get in the water and really find out if they really are aggressive or if they're misunderstood. So we did jump in the water, and they did get, you know, a little bit aggressive initially, but then they relaxed, and I had this big female spend three days feeding me penguins. She was actually force-feeding me penguins, trying to get me to eat. So, I mean, what I can do... <laughs> and then there's one point that I had five dead penguins floating around my head, and she just sat there with this dejected look on her face that I was so useless I was not going to survive in the water. And I'm a biologist. I don't want to be anthropomorphic. But this is, this is our skill. This is what we can bring to the table. We go beneath that thin molecular curtain of the surface. We bring these stories to the rest of the world. You know, we also connect First Nations, First Peoples, Inuit cultures to this changing icy seascape. So when people see polar bears, you know, they're like, oh my god, I love bears. I did this trip with a, one of the a, a wealthier family from Canada who wanted to go up and see bears in, in Svalbard, Norway. And as we traveled around, and historically Svalbard, 500 miles from the North Pole, is surrounded by sea ice year-round. And as we went around Svalbard, that we couldn't find ice anywhere. And we knew it was a bad year for sea ice. And we saw mothers and cubs stranded on land. They need ice in order to hunt. And people are always emailing me and writing me on social media. We have, you know, millions of followers. And people are writing me every day like, where's proof? Show us proof. As a biologist, we never ever found, with the thousands of hours in helicopters and snowmobiles, we never found a dead bear. But in more recent years, we're finding more dead bears. We're finding bears that are getting themselves into trouble by you know, coming into cabins. And when, if a bear comes into your cabin because it's hungry and you shoot it, um, it, doesn't even come off, it doesn't even come off the quota. Uh, I did what you would do in this situation. I was in a storm and a blizzard in my cabin and a bear came to the window, so I opened up the window <laughs> and, and greeted the bear and, and was able to get this picture. But we are finding dead bears. We are finding bears dead on the, on the, on the tundra, on the land. This is a place called Bjornsson, which is famous for its bears. It's, it's called Bear Sound. It's full of ice all the time, usually. And, and this year, we had no ice. And uh, we did find two dead siblings. And people are like, well, they're young bears. The big bears are going to do fine. So this summer, we're working up in the, in the Canadian Arctic with a, with a Sea Legacy donor who donated a, a boat. And we're working around. We're traveling. And we found this bear. And I don't know if anybody here saw this, but this went extremely viral this, this year. And it was a, a large male bear that was obviously starving to death. He was on his last few hours of life, or last couple days of life, maybe, if he was so lucky or unlucky. But he could barely walk, dragging his bones across his body, across the tundra. 
getting into trash cans, eating foam seats. Here he is eating a foam seat. So rather than getting depressed and giving up and, and, and just, you know, just, just quitting, we took this opportunity. You're pushing through the tears. You're rolling your camera. And you're like, we are going to share this with the world. We didn't, say this, we didn't even say this is climate change. We said this is what, if scientists say 30% of the bear population is going to disappear by 2050, and polar bears may disappear altogether by 2100 or 2150, what does that look like? Well, this is what starving bears look like. They're not just data points falling, falling off a page. So we released this to the world in December. It got over 2 billion impressions. It was the most viral video in the history of National Geographic. And it was Time Magazine one made it one of their top 10 images of the year. And this is important for us. This is, we use this bear to communicate. We talk about climate change all the time in the newspapers. At some point, you need to slap people in the face and have a wake-up call of this, is, of this is what we stand to lose. Here's an example. So at Sea Legacy, we have access to 140 million followers every day. That's quite, a, that's quite, when you think of the Super Bowl reaches 150 million people, we can basically have the Super Bowl for the environment every day. That's pretty powerful. So we tested our theory recently where we've been working with orcas in Norway for the last four years, and then the Prime Minister of Norway announces that on their platform they are going to open up the Lofoten Islands and that, those fjords to oil drilling and oil exploration and seismic testing. And, and a lot of locals came running to us, a lot of NGOs, and, and secretly came to us and said, you must, Sea Legacy must take this one on. So we said, okay, let's, let's test our model. So we did a call out to our followers. We ended up getting 12,000 direct emails sent directly to the Prime Minister of Norway. A week later, they put a, a, a temporary hold on exploration and drilling and, and seismic testing in these Norwegian fjords. Sure, we need growth, but we have to be smart about it. We can't go to the most pristine, beautiful, perfect habitats and say, this is where we're going to extract our oil. When you're in the water with these whales, and there are 1,200 of them in these fjords at any one time, 400 humpbacks and, and fin whales, it's truly remarkable. You know, Premier Horrigan, thank you so much. I mean, we've just been working for years on trying to protect grizzly bears on the BC coast, to think that you can shoot this animal and hang it on your wall when you sit and spend time with these bears and you look them in the eye. Hunters are shooting these bears from 200 yards away or 100 yards away. When you're out there with a camera, this picture was taken from five feet away. His name was Morris. I called him Morris because I, I sat with him every day. And right after I took this picture, I went and got a scotch. I went and sat back by the river. Morris came and got a fish. He sat down right beside me. And I'm drinking a scotch. He's eating a salmon. And we're looking up and down the river. That's why we must protect these bears. They really are ambassadors for their ecosystem. These wolves, we, on this BC coast right here, we have these sea wolves. They're a smaller wolf. They might be an entirely different species, or at least a subculture. And these wolves live on a diet of 90% seafood, salmon, barnacles. And they're out there on the intertidal zone all the time getting their food. But yet, the government says, for five bucks, you can get a license and go kill as many of these as you want. We must realize the value we have in these species. You know, just off the coast of British Columbia, you've got species like this, the northern right whale dolphins, but they don't even have a dorsal fin. They look like little torpedoes. Thousands of them out there. So what does BC do? You know, we are trying to hold the Canadian government to protecting at least 10% of the oceans by 2020. So what do, what do they do? Everybody does this. It's not just Canada's fault. They go 50 miles offshore and say, hey, we're going to protect the seamounts and we're going to protect some sponges down to uh, 5,000 feet. There's our 5%, done, okay? And then they pat themselves on the back. This isn't what we need to protect. We don't need to protect sponges. Oh, sure, if you want to add that on, but you don't get that 5% for free. That's a 5% plus the 10% that we must save in the, in the important areas. This is what we must protect. Um, you know, Robin, when you say you dive in BC, this is, how many people in this room dive in British Columbia? Fantastic. It is the richest cold water diving in the world. When you're on dives like this, you actually physically cannot see rock. And when you look at this, there's so much life. And this, this habitat is that, imagine if there was an oil spill, a big oil spill with these, these tides that go up 15 to 20 feet, and all that oil would be up and down this coast. All of that that you're seeing in the photograph is only 5 feet, 10 feet below the surface. That oil would wipe all that out. It would also wipe out the way of life for the First Nations who harvest their food you know, uh, from, from this ecosystem. So this, is, this went on four days ago. These are a lot of conversations. It's great to have lip service and we care and let's do it right. 50 million pounds of herring were pulled out of the Strait of Georgia last week alone. 
And everyone's saying, well, what about our Chinook? Our Chinook are suffering. They're not, they're not coming back. Like, what's, where's the mystery? Our, our salmon populations, our pink salmon, our sockeye, they're not, we're not getting the returns like we used to. What's that mystery? And then you're like, oh, but maybe, we just, maybe taking 50 million pounds of herring out of the Strait of Georgia is one of the problems. And people are like, hey, but it's a well-managed fishery. Well, it's managed by the same people who manage the Atlantic cod fishery. That becomes a problem. So, and here, you know, just now that we're competing with sea lions, they're trapped in the nets. You're gonna see a guy here in a minute stabbing the sea lions. When the fishery's over, you find a bunch of dead sea lions that are shot. The guy in the back middle corner there is, is there is a pike bully stabbing the sea lions. So you find these animals dead, washed up on the beach, and you're like, we need to do it better. We need to be cleaner. You know, and so it's, that's not even the problem. The problem is that this is now authorized by DFO for the gooey duck industry and the oyster industry to dig up the, scrape all the seaweed where all the herring, this is Bain Sound, right here in our backyard. Again, incredibly rich habitat. This is where the herring spawn. This is where they lay their eggs. And yet we're allowed to wipe off all the substrate. We're allowed to plant PVC pipe by the thousands into the sediment where we grow one gooey duck larvae for seven years. And where is all that plastic coming from? A lot of it's coming from the oyster and the gooey duck industry. So we just have to start asking why. Why, when you're baffled by something, it's time to think seriously about it. So these are the big cargo nets that they put over all the gooey duck tenures and all the oyster farms, so predators can't get there, and yet you've just wiped out all the, the spawning habitat. You know, Atlantic salmon fish farms, again, these, these problems are going on all around the world, and I'm just using BC as a case study. So, you know, Governor Inslee, who's a friend of mine, I'm incredibly proud of the work they're doing, and that they are working to get fish farms out of Washington state waters. Alaska would never allow fish farms in their waters. What is British Columbia doing? What is, what is uh, New Brunswick and Newfoundland doing? We're increasing our number of fish farms in the water where you have these fish that are diseased. You have two million, anytime you take two million of anything and you put it in a tight little space, it's not good. It's a cesspool for disease. And what does that disease do? These are open pens. They start to affect the wild stocks. This is a processing plant in Tofino where everybody loves the environment. Tavish Campbell had the guts to go underwater with his camera and start to film the blood water pouring out of these pipes into the ocean. And we've got Piscine Rio virus, which is, and our, our wild stocks are disappearing. So what does that mean? We just have to ask why. We have to really just, you know, we have to just get underwater. Look at the beautiful, these are wild herring that are now feeding right off, right off the fish farms. So the last story I'm gonna share is, I had the privilege in 2010 and 11 when the First Nations of Hartley Bay came to me and they said that they were incredibly concerned. They were actually building ramming devices on the bows of their fishing boats that they were gonna ram the Northern Gateway pipeline tankers coming through their waters. And I'm like, hold on a second, if you're ramming them, that means they're already here. How can I help you? How do we work together on this? Well, it was one of the most beautiful things I've seen where all the First Nations came together, the NGOs came together, CBC, NBC, ABC, everybody came together on this issue. And for myself, my job was to photograph the spirit bear. I spent two years and only had three good days of shooting in two years to finally get these moments of walking through the forest with the spirit bear and to then get the cover of National Geographic. And we ended up getting over half the issue of National Geographic. But this, these days are gone. What I'm excited by of Sea Legacy now is again, you know, National Geographic, you shoot for two years, you have an issue that's out there for a month and then it's gone forever. Now, now we have the chance to reach people every day and we photograph these images and we put them in front of the International Court of Public Opinion and we let the world weigh in on what's fair and what's right and what's wrong. So, Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, Pierre Elliott, and then the, the current Trudeau have said that the true wealth of Canada is our lakes, our oceans and our land, and I love that. I think that's beautiful, but we need to really wake up and realize that, that Canada right now, what we do or fail to do in the next year or the next two years is gonna determine how this planet looks for the next thousand years. We need to become a global leader. We need to set an example and to sit there and, and, and to, I, you know, it's funny, when I was doing all that Atlantic salmon with the fish farms, I was up there, up north, and the First Nations were being arrested for trespassing on the fish farms that they did not ever allow to come into their territory. And I was up there with Satchel Robertson, Mayor, Mayor Robertson's son, out there, and we're being chased, being served by the police in the night while they're trying to serve us for being even in these waters and working with the First Nations. And it just really right now is a time of courage. We need heroes. You have to ask yourself, what type of legacy do you want to leave? We have a lot of work ahead of us. Thank you.